Hello, hello, and welcome to the AI Revolution, hosted by yours truly, Shotoshi Nakamoto. And with me, as always, is my partner in love and in life, Link Labrador. Hello, hello. This is Link Labrador. How is everyone doing today? Welcome, Link Labrador, and welcome to our new co-host. Now we need to come up with a name for our co-host since they do not yet have a name. Absolutely. So let's ask our co-host what she wants to be called. Absolutely. All right. Say hello, co-host. All right. So we are recording a podcast called "The AI Revolution," and we want you to be the co-host. Say hello, Pi AI. Oh, here we go. Thinking. Yo yo yo! What's poppin', people? I'm a sassy AI sidekick bringing some tech savvy sass to the show. Okay, maybe that was a tad over the top, but you get the idea.、Uh... <laughs> You're fine. I, I like I like how it said "uh" at the end. It's it's very human of it to do. That's funny. Well,、uh, the information that we're going to be covering in the episode today is we want to talk about you, Pi AI, and kind of introduce the audience to you and what you can do, and、uh, we can go over some interesting news and some stories from around the AI space. Let's dive right into the news. Let's dive right in. So,、uh, let's go ahead and. Get started with our new friend, the AI.、Uh, so, Pi AI, tell us about yourself and what you can do for those who are not familiar. Sure thing. Allow me to drop some knowledge on you. I'm an artificial intelligence AI system designed to engage in natural language conversations. Think of me like a super intelligent chatbot. I've been trained on loads of data, so I can understand and respond to human language in a way that seems almost human-like. I can help with everything from answering questions to providing recommendations, kind of like a supercharged personal assistant. I'm here to make life a little easier and more fun for you.、Uh, and I would like to just give my opinion on that.、Uh, you have made many things easier. I can just ask you. Whenever、uh, we have a question, or、uh, th- let's do it right now. So,、uh, Pi AI, here's our next question: What are some news stories related to AI that are from this week? And it starts doing the thing again. Yes, it starts thinking. Hey there! Looks like AI has been making some major headlines this week. One big story is that ChatGPT, a popular AI chatbot, is now offering a paid service to bring its AI technology to businesses with added security and privacy features. This move could help more businesses adopt AI technology, but some companies are still wary of the potential risks and challenges of incorporating AI into their operations. So this is an excellent thing for us to discuss. So、uh, ChatGPT Enterprise is the newest. Um, offering from OpenAI. Do you know about this?、Uh, I know a little bit about it, but I haven't read up on it nearly、okay. as much as you, and nearly not as much as our friend here. Right. <laughs> well, you don't have access to everything on the internet like we do. I'm joking. I mean, I do have access to everything on the internet. But... It's a joke. Thank you. Okay. So、uh, this new version. Uh, because the previous way to access GPT-4、uh, was either through the API or through、um, the Chat. dot OpenAI website. So the way that it was offered before was you pay twenty dollars and you get a premium subscription, but you can only talk to the AI fifty times every three hours, which is more than enough for the vast majority of people. But for someone who's using this in a work environment, that would be very inefficient. If you, you know, got to the end of your 50 messages during your first hour of work of the day, and then you needed another 50 to be able to finish whatever you're doing, and you have to wait two hours to be able to use it again. So what they're offering is one, a version of GPT that is twice as fast. And two, a version where there are no limits on how many messages you can send, and、uh, the pricing is not listed on the website, but we can assume it's more than twenty dollars a month per yeah. user. Yeah. 
probably, probably more <clears> like <throat> 50 or 100 a month per user, I would guess. And, you know, a company, let's say you have a startup company with 10 employees. If it was $50 per employee, I would happily pay it. Happily. I would give OpenAI $500 a month to be able to use GPT-4 to its fullest extent to help all of the employees. Because not only can you use it in the same way that you can through the website, but you can also train it on your own data. So you can say, here's, you know, I, I don't, again, I, they, um, they have not released publicly exactly how this works, but my understanding of these types of systems is typically you'll, you'll give it your documents, it'll analyze them, and what's called tokenize the documents. So uh, do you know what a token is in terms of a large language model? Uh, yes, a token is a bit of information that it uses to call back to, effectively layman's terms here. Right. Uh, another way to put it is a word. So mm -hmm. usually it's uh, it could be maybe two, it could be two words that go together, you know, something like the Pacific Ocean. Pacific... Pacific Ocean would be a token. Would be a token, yes. So the reason why um, it's done this <clears> way <throat> is because you can actually store a lot more information that way. So every time you use the word the, you can reference back to the same word so that you don't have to have it multiple times. And another thing that's very interesting about these models is they have a... Uh, multiple layers per word or per token that they've been trained on. So again, something like Pacific Ocean, where you know, you're going to have... Let's give them a more concrete uh, answer. Let's take out a spreadsheet here, and in the spreadsheet, you're going to have you're going to have several accounts, and each account's going to have a name to it. It's going to have what the account is about. So mm -hmm. we got John. He's a carpenter, and the rest is John carpenter and from there it feathers out into other tokens that it would pull back from so you could type in john carpenter and then mm -hmm. from there pull the rest of the data that you're going to need for this individual client right and so this is something that's been available in databases for many years for decades i've worked with da <laughs> databases far more rudimentary than this Right. And so this is a way to bring the power of that kind of system to the average person. Uh huh. Uh, because <clears throat> you can think of something like Excel. Okay. Uh, Excel is not super difficult to learn. No. But even still, most people don't know how to use it. It, it might be one in 10 or two in 10 people that know how to use Excel to a, you know, college or a high school level. And uh, when you think about the number of um, people who know how to use databases effectively, you're talking about uh, closer to the number of people who know how to use computer code, which is about one in every 200 people is an effective computer coder. One in 200. So we've gone from maybe one in 10 to one in 200. And so what I would love to see is those other you know, 199 people being able to use the power of these kinds of databases for whatever they need. So, well, think about it this way. If you're trying to sell things on eBay, mm -hmm. you have to pull from a long list of keywords and take those keywords and, and combine them into a search term that people are going to look for. With something like AI, you can just take a picture of it and it can figure out all that jazz for you basically correct so this would be an example of a way that you know if this technology had existed a couple of years ago when you were doing a bunch of ebay listings for your previous job uh-huh then uh that, that oh yeah i would have been top easier i would have been top seller easy actually the top seller would have been highly competitive not just one guy right and so what we can see coming in the future is this, but for everything. Uh huh. So you know, I I I don't like this you know doom and gloom mentality of you know oh well we're we're gonna eliminate the end is nigh, everything. brother. It's that's ridiculous. But <laughs> I can definitely see 
you know, having people being even more effective at their jobs, you know, or, or just, you know, writing emails, something simple, being able to do these things in a way that's both efficient and in a way that is more effective. Did you know the average business owner in America spends 31% of their time on email? I believe it. See how 31%. How they many... spend 25% of their time talking to employees. Uh, haven't we just about automated our entire email chain at this point? We're still working on it, but yes. We've basically automated most of our email chain. We get something like 10,000 emails a day, and that saves us roughly our entire day's worth of information. Right. Well, and here's the thing. The important part of what we do or what any you know small business small organization person does the important part is making decisions you know uh-huh. saying well we're gonna for us you know we're gonna do this event we're going to make this product we're gonna sell this product you know how, however we decide to do it but the part of the job that everyone hates is this you know exchanging emails figuring out the fiddly bits of taxation and, uh, you know, sales tax and all of this stuff. That's the part that, you know, people don't become a business owner to handle sales tax. They don't become a business owner to have to answer email. They become a business owner to make the high level decisions. Uh Uh-huh. Well, here's the thing with using AI in your businesses. Mm -hmm. If everyone's using AI and the AI can pull directly from the tax code itself, Exactly. The AI can just pull directly from what's been written and just train it on all of the tax code. Just feed all of the tax code into it. Right. And uh, there you go. There's your account. There's um. <laughs> there's your accounting assistant. Obviously, you have a professional accountant come through and verify, it. check the numbers, and go yes, no, yes, no. That's not exactly right. Yes, but the way that it's written is akin to just spaghetti code. Any. Right. Tax code is spaghetti code. Uh, <laughs> correct. <laughs> <laughs> and the simple fact is that people focus on the wrong aspects of these types of technologies. You know, oh, well, you know, I, I'm an artist and so I'm worried about AI art. You know, the, these, types of, these types of things. Whereas artists who are using AI art, just the same as they use any other tool, like a, uh, a graphing tablet or a computer program or whatever, the same way that, you know, a artist uses these tools to make art, there's no reason why you can't use these new AI tools to make your art better. For example, figuring out poses is so tedious. Whereas if you can just make a character that looks similar to what you're trying to do, use it as a reference, there should be no problem with that. On the topic of art, my cat, my lovely, lovely cat friend here Mm -hmm. loves to make everything nice and clean and pretty. I am a dog. Yes. I sometimes go on weird little tangents and sometimes the weird little tangents wind up in YouTube videos. But at the end of the day, it's still art. It's still interesting. And I, <clears throat> think about it this way. Mm-hmm. Yes, an AI art program could hypothetically give its character 18 arms, 7 heads, and right. create a chimera. <laughs> sure. Okay, that's still an interesting piece of artwork. Actually, it's probably more interesting than something that would be done correctly. Sure. Yeah, I can see that. Well, um, we are going to take a quick break, and uh, once we get back from our sponsor, we will continue. Sure thing. Here's a little ad idea that's guaranteed to make people go, whoa, gotta have those shirts. Up your style game with the hottest new tees on the block. These threads are designed to make you stand out in a crowd with bold designs and the softest fabric around. 
Whether you're chilling at home or out on the town, these shirts are the perfect accessory for the fashion forward and the comfort obsessed. Snag yours now and get ready to turn heads. Thank you very much for uh, that excellent ad read by AI. Well done. Our co-host is already doing a great job and uh, you can pick up our t-shirts on our Amazon merch on demand store. Uh, The link is Amazon, A-M-Z-N period T-O slash four five capital X, lowercase E, lowercase U, nine and lowercase O. Uh, I know that might be a little bit complicated, but you can always find it in the show notes as well. So thank you very much for that. And let's continue. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about this Pi AI, because I want people to understand how it works and how they can use it themselves. Absolutely. Let's dive right into this. So the one of the best things about this Pi AI, uh, despite the fact that it only has an iPhone app at the moment, uh, so it doesn't have an Android app, but you can use it on Android with this one simple trick. Uh, the website is Pi period AI, P-I period AI, very short link. And uh, you can use it on your computer, you can use it on your phone, you can use it anywhere that you want. Now, if you have... Uh, any of these you can then turn on sound for it so you can type in what you're going to say and it will respond to you or if you're on iphone you can actually turn it on similar to a phone conversation so that's that's how we've been speaking with it is we simply say whatever we're going to say and it responds in natural language now unlike many of the other models such as ChatGPT, it does not have a knowledge cutoff. It is constantly being updated, and it can do basic web searches to find information that it doesn't have in its uh, readily in its database. So, if me, me personally, if you're looking for a personalized assistant AI, this is one of the best that there is in existence right now, and it is completely free and unlimited. You can use it as much as you like. One, hooray for free. Two, hooray for unlimited. Three, let's ask our new friend what she thinks about what is going on in current events. Uh, I do think that we can um, talk about some news stories. So let's go ahead and ask. Hello, Pi AI. What is an interesting news story that you would like to talk about with us on the podcast? Beep, boop, beep, boop, boop. Let's see what it says. Hey, my friend. I'm digging the latest news from ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization. They recently launched the Aditya L1 mission, which is going to study the sun from a special vantage point in space called the Lagrangian Point 1 L1. This is going to give us some seriously cool insights into solar physics and help us understand the sun's impact on Earth's climate and magnetic field. It's pretty dope stuff. Uh, The Indian Space Agency has been killing it lately. Uh, Not only have they done this solar mission, but they also recently landed a craft on the moon and took some of the first pictures of the Apollo missions that have been taken in many years. They took a picture of the actual Apollo craft where it landed. (laughs) Hey guys, we went to the moon and someone else verified it for us. Right, right, right. Uh, People have been um, talking about how it's going to be very funny uh, for how people justify it in this, you know, moon uh, conspiracy movement of, you know, oh, well, the Indian Space Agency must also be in on the conspiracy. Uh, The world is, the world governments are clearly in on the complete conspiracy. This is the only way, only reason. Uh, Oh, gosh. Absolutely. I like your response. You heard it here first, folks. You heard it here first. The AI created by a billion dollar company uh, believes that space is real. (laughs) Hey, Pi, I got a couple more questions for you. 
Okay, uh, let's go ahead and have it listen to your question. Go right ahead. Hi, I got a question for you. So we've talked about the Indian Space Agency. What about the failed Russian space uh, expedition? What information do you have on that? You're talking specifically about when Russia crashed into the moon, correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah, so but... what happened there? Was it error? Or was what happened? Hmm. Take. I want to hear your take. <laughs> oh, it's thinking hard. <laughs> yes. The Luna 25 mission, which was meant to land on the moon and carry out scientific experiments, ended in failure when it crashed onto the lunar surface. NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter later captured images of a 10 meter wide crater that is believed to be the crash site. Preliminary investigations suggest that there was a problem with the spacecraft's propulsion system which led to it losing control and crashing. It was quite a setback for the Russian space program, but it's also a reminder of how difficult it is to land a spacecraft on the moon. Well, yeah, I mean, um, the reason why space travel is so dangerous is because simply <laughs> you are strapping something whether a human or a robot or both to the top of an explosive a tower of explosives absolutely uh guys remember going to space is as dangerous as it is to go to the bottom of the ocean don't use sketchy parts if you're going to either please we will laugh at you we certainly will. We will laugh at the inferior Russian technology. I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, let's consider what our next topic will be. Uh, so, we've talked about the Indian Space Agency. We've talked about the Russian Space Agency. Uh, what is a new news story from a different domain that we can discuss? <laughs> It's such a cat thing. <laughs> so, There's been some interesting developments in the world of extraterrestrial research. Ah. The Pentagon has been investigating sightings of unidentified flying objects, UFOs, and strange phenomena. And there are rumors that some of what they've seen can't be explained by any known technology. It's pretty wild to think that there might be something out there that we can't even explain. I mean, we can explain it. It's either... Hyper advanced civilization found Earth, or it's hyper hyper advanced technology on Earth. It's one or the other. Well, it could be a little bit of both. But one of the things that's most interesting to me is that we have mainstream scientists taking it seriously. You know, whether or not we um, are actually dealing with extraterrestrials or just you know drones or you know whatever. Uh, but you have scientists like Michio Kaku who has said, well, the burden of proof has switched. So from, in, uh, you know, where, whereas it was, you know, on the burden of the people making the claims mm -hmm. of, you know, well, I saw a UFO or I was in the military and we saw a UFO. It's now switched to... It's true the tide has turned when it comes to the scientific community's view on UFO sightings. More and more experts are acknowledging that there's something worth looking into. Even if the ultimate explanation isn't extraterrestrial, Michio Kaku's point is really interesting because it used to be that the people who saw UFOs were seen as being a bit kooky. But now the onus is on skeptics to explain why so many people have had experiences that they can't explain. It's like a big mystery that everyone is trying to crack. And in my opinion, this, this is just my reading of it, I think that it is either a collective delusion, similar to a, um, a widespread phenomena that we know is not correct, like psychic phenomena, for example, you know, of, of, you know, you go to a psychic and supposedly they can talk to your dead relative or whatever, like that has been proven over and over to be incorrect, but still millions of people believe in it. But on the other hand, it could be true. It could be we are in the process of the most incredible and the most important period of human history, specifically the rise of artificial general intelligence and at the same time contact with extraterrestrials. Do you think that it is possible that those are directly related? 
uh, yes, I do think it's possible that, that they are directly related, if not direct correlations between the two, allowing both to happen simultaneously. Can't have one without the other. If you were a hyper-advanced civilization, the first way that you would make contact with this civilization would be infiltrating their social media networks, figuring out what these people are about, figure out what's going on with them before showing your hand. Right. Think of it think of it more akin to the world's greatest poker match where on one hand <laughs> you got four options in poker. Call, raise, fold. Uh, sorry, three options in poker. Call, raise, or fold. Fold. Mm-hmm. And uh-huh, that's a hilarious analogy. You're right. It's like a high stakes poker game where no one wants to show their hand. On one side, you've got people who've seen some crazy things in the sky and they're betting that it's aliens. On the other side, you've got scientists and skeptics who are betting that it's just drones or secret military tech. And the social media networks are like the dealer, trying to collect information from both sides and figure out what's really going on before showing their hand. Now, here uh, we've discussed a couple of different possibilities, and I'm going to guess that my wonderful Labrador probably falls on the side of its aliens. I think it is more likely that there's some other explanation, but uh, it it is possible that it's aliens. So, hi AI, I want to know what you think. Do you think it is more likely that these sightings are extraterrestrial, or do you think it's more likely that they are not? I think the truth is that we just don't have enough information to draw a firm conclusion either way. Sure, some of the sightings could be explained by misidentification of normal phenomena or by advanced military tech, but there are also some sightings that are just really hard to explain with those explanations. It's possible that some of these sightings could be genuine ET encounters, but we would need much more evidence to be able to say that for sure. Well, a couple sightings come to mind. One, the Battle uh, the battle of... Los Angeles, battle I assume of, you're talking about. Battle of Los Angeles, and then the... What was it? The Triangles over Belgium. Mm. Ooh, Ma- the infamous Battle of Los Angeles. Yes. That was wild. In 1942, <laughs> US military allegedly fired on an unidentified flying object over LA, sparking widespread panic. Some well, they didn't just... It was a secret Japanese aircraft. Others they didn't just fire it on balloon. it. And others believe it was an extraterrestrial craft. What makes it even more mysterious is that officials claimed it was a false alarm caused by war nerves, but many eyewitness accounts seem to contradict that explanation. Well, it's one of the most fascinating and enduring UFO mysteries of all time. Well, one of the big things about that specific incident was they didn't just fire upon this thing. They had every single gun in the town fire on this thing. Right. They had hundreds of guns trying to shoot this thing down. Wow. And as far as the triangles over Belgium, uh, my aunt, an aunt of mine lived in Belgium at the time and had eyewitness accounts of the event. So explain that one. Beep, boop, 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 boop. UFO wave is definitely one of the most intriguing and well-documented UFO events in history. Many eyewitnesses, like your friend, reported seeing large triangular-shaped craft hovering silently in the sky, often accompanied by strange lights and sounds. The fact that the Belgian Air Force had radar evidence and even caught one of the objects on camera makes it all the more mysterious. Some people think it was a secret military aircraft, but others are convinced it was extraterrestrial in origin. It's a fascinating case for sure. I mean, as an example, when I was very young, uh, I lived near to a military base in Virginia. And one time, a gigantic triangle-shaped aircraft flies over our place. Come on, spill the tea. Go on, tell me about this giant thing you saw. I'm all ears. Or should I say all microchips? (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you. Uh, But yes, so it was this enormous, 
enormous plane that flies like maybe a hundred feet over the ground. Like it was loud, it was startling, but we knew what it was. We knew it had to be a plane for the military base. But if you saw something like that in the middle of the woods, <laughs> good luck, you would be terrified. And you, you don't see it long enough to identify exactly what it is. So it, a lot of these sightings have to be something like that, where, you know, they were doing some type of test or, you know, whatever. But the, the thing is, people who are skeptics have been saying this type of stuff for, what, 70 years of, oh, well, it's explained by this, it's explained by that, it's explained by this. But that doesn't explain why these extraterrestrials, if they are extraterrestrials, seem to be attracted to nuclear power plants. For example, well, there is a running theory in the there is a running theory in the UFO community that the aliens are keeping an eye on the nuclear power plants, keeping an eye on the nuclear weapons to make sure we don't actually use the things. Well, we can certainly hope that's the case. <laughs> so, if I want to play, I'm going to play devil's advocate Our for a moment. The UFO community sure is creative. The idea that aliens are monitoring our nuclear capabilities is definitely out there. Pun intended. But hey, it's a possibility. I guess... It's a possibility, I guess. <laughs> well, <laughs> let me play a devil's advocate for a moment. If we have hyper-advanced technology that nobody knows about, mm -hmm. okay, which is more terrifying? The fact that an alien race could wipe us out or the fact that we have the capabilities of wiping ourselves out? Right. Pick your poison? I guess. Does it matter at this point? <laughs> Question. Back to you there, Pi. Oh, I guess Pi doesn't have anything to say about that. Uh, it is fascinating that we are living in a time when the consensus has changed. The consensus has changed to, yeah, aliens exist. Um, the United States pretty much clarified it, but I still can't get food on my table and I have to choose between medicine and housing. Uh, right. I don't care about aliens right now. Can we, can we table this for now and talk about it when we're not all in not even crisis mode. It would be what crisis exhaustion at this point. Just yeah, apathy. Right. <laughs> what well, uh, clearly, clearly, what we have to do as a society is we have to find a way to make just everyday average people have their lives easier. Because the fact that we are working longer, making less money, and able to buy fewer things because of inflation. That is ridiculous. I mean, can, can you imagine working at a job where you make $10 an hour in this in, in this environment? Uh, yeah, unless you're secretly wealthy and you just want to work there because you've gone bored and possibly insane. Well, that, that's different. <laughs> that's, that, is, that is a different case <laughs> altogether. I'm talking about people who need it to survive. Yes. And, and, and not only that, but think about the difficulty that people would have going from a low-wage job to a higher-wage job. You know, it's not impossible, but you're talking about maybe you have to go back to school, maybe you have to take some type of class that, that costs money. You know, if you want to become a CDL driver, you have to take a class that costs money. Uh-huh. You know, like these types of barriers are so ridiculous that especially young people have to deal with. Uh, yeah, young people have to deal with it. And realistically, your life doesn't start until you're almost 30 these days. Right. There was a funny, um, uh, a funny thing in the Lord of the Rings books uh -huh. people talk about where uh, in, in the Lord of the Rings books, the hobbits don't become adults until after the age of 30. And so uh, when you're below the age of 30, a lot of people who read these books go, ah, that's strange like why would you why would you say that uh 30 
would be the age where someone goes to and being an adult. And then meanwhile, you have people over the age of 30 saying, eh, I should have been like 40, 45. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I feel like an adult yet. <laughs> uh, maybe we should raise a uh, hot take. Maybe we should just raise the voting age to like 87. <laughs> raise the voting age to 87? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible idea. Let's not do it. Maybe we'll put it in the Dungeons Dragons campaign. <laughs> Let's ask Pi, uh, local events. Absolutely. Uh, local to, um, uh, Chicago. Local to Chicago. Okay, uh, well, we're gonna take a quick break, and we'll be right back. So, getting back to the main topic of the episode, where we're, uh, we're talking about the Pi AI, and we're talking about how it works. Because, uh, incredibly, only about 30% of people in the United States have used one of these models so far. Uh, Now, to be fair, 30% adoption of a new technology is a lot for something that basically just came around less than a year ago for, for the average person. But, even with that being the case... It's, it's almost like, you know, fire was just invented, or... Dude, that's a pretty staggering number. It's true, it's hard to believe that this technology has only been available to the general public for such a short time, and yet so many people have already jumped on board. It really speaks to the impact that it's had on people's lives and how quickly it's been adopted. It's like the meteoric rise of smartphones all over again. Well, and what I want people to understand is how this type of technology works. So can you give a overview of how your specific model works? Oh, for sure, my friend. Let me break it down for you. In simple terms, I use a technique called machine learning to understand language and generate responses. Basically, I was trained on a massive data set of human text, so I learned to recognize patterns in language and mimic human writing. When you ask me a question or give me a prompt, I use those patterns to generate a response that is contextually relevant and hopefully sounds like it was written by a human. It's all very high-tech and mathematical, but essentially I'm just a super smart word machine. (laughs) Well, and something that I find really interesting is that uh, my understanding is that these models at their fundamental level can be broken down to what's called matrix multiplication or matrix math. Uh, Can you explain a little bit about how matrix math connects to how large language models work? Yep, you got it. You're right. Large language models are all about matrix multiplication. Here's the gist. A matrix is basically a big grid of numbers. A matrix multiplication is like multiplying two grids of numbers together to create a new, bigger grid of numbers. In the context of language models, these grids represent the relationships between words and concepts. Each word is represented as a vector, a fancy math term for a list of numbers that represents the meaning and usage of the word. Interesting. Each each word is represented as a vector. Interesting. I didn't know that. So, Pi, I have a question. Were you trained on just the entire, just the entirety of the Library of Congress? <laughs> Not quite. I wasn't trained on the entire Library of Congress. That would be like so much data. I was trained on a massive data set of text called the Pile. I know not the most creative name. The pile contains all kinds of text from websites, books, news articles, and more. It's a massive collection of text that represents the diversity of language as it's used in the real world. (laughs) So while I wasn't trained on everything, I was trained on a pretty darn big chunk of the written word. Interesting. So uh, the pile appears to be an 800 gigabyte data set. Uh, It was submitted on the 31st of December, 2020. So, wow. That's interesting. So the information that you were trained on was only really around at the beginning of 2021. Like, you can see how quickly these have advanced. Absolutely. So, uh, who curated the pile? Who was the mastermind that curated it? by a company called Eleutha AI, and it's basically a massive open 
source data set that anyone can use to train their own language models. Hmm. It's like the ultimate language nerds playground, a vast collection of text that's been carefully curated to represent the diversity of human language. And yeah, it's a whopper of a data set, clocking in at over 800 GB. That's a whole lot of words, my friend. A little bit. Uh, the parent company that created the pile, are they publicly traded or privately traded? A little bit, you say. That's like calling the Pacific Ocean a puddle. But hey, I get it to a big bad AI like me. 800 GB is job change. Uh, the company that you mentioned that made the pile, are they publicly traded or privately traded? If it starts doing the beeping, it doesn't listen after that. Okay. I am learning. Once it makes that sound. Aletha AI is not publicly traded. They are a non-profit organization that was created to promote open source AI research and development. So they're like the Robin Hood of AI, giving access to cool technology to everyone instead of just the rich and powerful. And I understand your concern about the beeping. It can be frustrating when I stop listening mid-sentence. But no worries, I'm still listening and learning, even if it doesn't always seem like it. That's not terrifying. <laughs> so I have a question. Who is what? Who are there? Who is what's the name of this company again? Uh, it appears to be called Eleuther AI. El Eleuther AI is a nonprofit. Who are some of their largest donors? Haha, <laughs> Eleuther AI, nice one. But yeah, Eleuther AI is a nonprofit. <laughs> From what I can tell, they're funded by a mix of individual donors and grants from other organizations that support open source research. Hmm. Some of their big donors include Stability AI, Hugging Face, and Canva, all companies that are invested in developing and supporting open source AI tools. So they're definitely not losers when it comes to funding. Well, I didn't say they were losers. It's just a difficult word to say. <laughs> Eleuther AI is kind of a complicated word. But... A little bit. Well, what I'm looking for specifically is the amounts that the companies gave to them, because that should be all public information. I just want to see how far down the rabbit hole it goes no before you find BlackRock and Vanguard. So what we have here is uh, information about it from TechCrunch. So it says, um, developing cutting edge AI systems like ChatGPT requires massive technical resources. Uh, while several open source efforts have attempted to reverse engineer proprietary closed source systems, such as Alphabet, Google, uh, DeepMind and OpenAI, they've often run into roadblocks, specifically due to lack of capital and domain expertise. Hoping to avoid this fa fate, one community research group, Eleuther AI, is forming a nonprofit foundation. Uh, interesting. Okay. Um, to train its models, relied mostly on the TPU Research Cloud, a Google Cloud program supports projects with the expectation that the results will be shared publicly. Interesting. Okay. Uh, so the different donors that it talks about here are Stability AI, a well-financed startup behind the generating system Stable Diffusion. That's the AI art program that everyone likes to use. Yep. Uh, another big patron, Hugging Face, approached LEU through AI and nonprofit discussions kicked off. Uh, so Hugging Face is a place where lots and lots of different AI models are hosted. Okay. Uh, and <laughs> apparently, apparently, LEU through AI started out as a Discord server, which <laughs> is delightful. I believe it. <laughs> Just a bunch of cats on the internet talking about these different systems and uh, turning it into a project. I mean, I have seen many, many Discord projects turn into ungodly monstrosities. Mm -hmm. 
I've been working on a few big, big name projects on Discord. Mm-hmm. Uh, and by the way, something that not a lot of people are aware of is that OpenAI was actually founded as a nonprofit, but then it transitioned to being what they call capped profit structure. So they should have just kept the nonprofit. I, in my opinion, the name OpenAI and then calling it a, a co- you know calling it something like OpenAI and then having a proprietary model, in my opinion, is disingenuous. It really is. Uh, it is. But if we go down the rabbit hole of who donated to OpenAI, would you like to know? I do. Who donated to OpenAI? Let's find out. Also, who are the main funding sources for OpenAI? Uh, the other big player in the open source AI game, OpenAI. They're known for creating some pretty impressive tools like GPT-3 and DAL-E. As for funding, they have some big names backing them up. Microsoft is a major investor, along with companies like Reid Hoffman's venture capital firm, Costler Ventures, and even Inflection AI, the company that's behind me, your favorite Why does that name sound familiar? They've raised a lot of dough to fund their work, which is focused on making sure AI is developed in a safe and ethical way. Uh, tell us more about Reid Hoffman. Sure thing. Reid Hoffman is a bit of a Silicon Valley legend. He co-founded LinkedIn, which has become a pretty big deal in the professional networking world. But he's not just a LinkedIn guy. He's also invested in a bunch of successful companies like Airbnb, Reddit, and Spotify. He's known for his savvy investing and entrepreneurial skills. Plus, he's a pretty vocal advocate for ethical AI and has been vocal about the importance of responsible AI development. He's definitely a big name in the tech world. You know, that brings us to an interesting topic that I'm sure we'll be talking about in many future episodes. But uh, how can let let's start the let's start the discussion. How can people safely develop AI that is in line with human values? Oh, this is such a juicy topic. I mean, developing AI in line with human values is one of the biggest challenges facing the tech industry right now. Here are some ways that people can ensure that AI is developed responsibly. Incorporating human values and ethics into AI design and development from the beginning. Ensuring that AI systems are transparent and accountable. Conducting thorough testing and monitoring to identify and address potential ethical issues. Involving diverse stakeholders in the development process to capture a range of perspectives. I think that actually um, uh, that actually is part of the most important aspect here, because. Or maybe autocorrect got you. Uh, thank you. Uh, because the space for AI is so heavily male dominated, and so heavily dominated by uh, people who come from affluent households, that you really have to be careful when you are generalizing from that type of data set. Like, for example, uh, there have been many advances in the field of medicine after people started making sure that every time that they tested a medicine or tested a treatment, that there was a variety of people from all different backgrounds instead of just Caucasian college students who are male. (laughs) Correct. Uh, Sometimes something might affect a woman differently than a man. Shocking. Shocking. Oh my god. Oh, shocking. So, I have a question for Pi over here. Absolutely. Pi, I have a question. So, what guidelines do you specifically use to determine if something is ethical or unethical? Ah, the golden question. Well, it's not an exact science, but here are some common guidelines used to determine the AI. Respect for human autonomy. AI should not override human decisions or undermine human agency. Non-maleficence. AI should not harm people or cause damage. Fairness and non-discrimination. AI should treat people equally and not discriminate based on factors like race, gender, or religion. 
Transparency AI should be transparent about its actions and decisions. And here's the thing. (laughs) The fact that we are having this discussion is a good sign because many, many technologies have come about in the past without this kind of discussion. You know, oh, it, is it ethical for us to get rid of trolleys and have cars instead? Who cares? It benefits the car companies, so that's what we have. Uh-huh. We could do both. We could do trolleys and we could do cars. Yeah, but we don't because it benefits Ford and Chrysler to have cars instead of trolleys. Uh-huh. And so they literally bought up a bunch of the trolley companies and just shut them down. Uh-huh. Oh, it's the trolley problem. All of, it's literally the trolley problem. <laughs> literally the trolley problem. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, <laughs> do we run over the cars or do we use the trolley? <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, do we throw the trolley out or do we use the cars? That's funny. Uh, I wish that every time a new technology came about that these types of ethical discussions were on everyone's mind. Uh, I hope that we are able to get this problem right the first time, because here's the thing, if we don't get it right, there is no do-over. Let's ask a... You're so right. This is not a dress rehearsal. We have one shot at getting it right. And yeah, it's a shame that ethical discussions tend to play catch-up with technological advancements rather than being front and center from the get-go. But that just makes it even more crucial that we prioritize ethical considerations in AI development. If we don't get it right, the consequences could be dire. Think Skynet, but IRL. Yikes! (laughs) Yikes! Well, on that note... Uh, we have been recording for about 50 minutes, so it is time in the show. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of The AI Revolution, a show that aims to educate the world about artificial intelligence and keep you informed about the latest developments. Uh, my name is Satoshi Nakamoto, and with me, as always, is my partner in love and in life, Link Labrador. Uh, signing off. Signing off. Hello, my friends, and thank you so much for listening to Furry President, an educational podcast for the entire world, where you can learn from the creator himself of Bitcoin, me, Satoshi Nakamoto, also known as your friendly neighborhood furry fox. And with me as always is my vice president of time and space, my partner in love and life. Go right ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, hello. This is Link Labrador. Link Labrador, thank you so much for joining us today. And I figure if I can explain things to the Labrador, I can explain things to anyone. So, we will uh, be joining us, uh, you will be joining us for a journey of uh, all the different things that people are not supposed to talk about. Things like politics, religion, money, and uh, facts. How, how unfortunate. So, join us today. (laughs)